Why are the United States, Germany, and Japan keen to develop cars, and Italy, Spain, France, and the United Kingdom have also squeezed into the same track one after another, chasing each other? Because a strong automobile industry is an important symbol of a modern industrial power. Developing a car is not like building a rocket carrier, instead, making a car is a test of a country's industrial system. The industrial chain of the automobile industry is very long, from the supply of raw materials, the production of parts and components, to the sales, all of which are closely linked. Therefore, large and small automobile industry clusters are formed on a global scale. Separated from the industrial cluster, a solitary car factory cannot survive at all. In the summer of 1896, Li Hongzhang was sent to visit Germany. The 74-year-old man was as depressed as a dying bull because of the defeat in the Sino-Japanese War. As soon as he received an errand, he set off with a coffin, fearing that he would die halfway. At this time, there are still five years before Li Hongzhang's death, and sixteen years before the demise of the Qing dynasty. In Bismarck's private garden, Li Hongzhang asked him two questions, first, what should China do to be as strong as Germany? Second, how can we carry out reforms in China? These two puzzles are comparable to Genesis. So how did the Chinese, who started so late, build their own cars and their own industrial system. In this video, let's talk about the three breakthroughs of China-made cars. In 1949, the first year of the founding of the People's Republic of China, due to the melee for decades, arable land was deserted, factories collapsed, and tens of thousands of kilometers of railways, 3,200 bridges, and more than 200 tunnels were destroyed. The former, Paramount Kingdom, has actually become the poorest country with an annual per capita national income of 27 US dollars, which is even far lower than that of 44 US dollars in the whole of Asia. Faced with such a mess, Chairman Mao Zedong said, what can we do now? We can make tables and chairs, teapots, tableware, and paper, but not even a car, a plane, a tank, or a tractor. At the end of 1949, Mao Zedong went to the Soviet Union. On February 14, 1950, that is, after Mao Zedong stayed in the Soviet Union for more than two months, China and the Soviet Union finally finalized a batch of key industrial projects that the Soviet Union assisted China to build. These aid projects, also known as Project 156 later, cover almost all core industrial fields such as energy, metallurgy, chemical industry, machinery, and light industry, including an automobile factory project. China needs car factories too much, because in those days, the Chinese have suffered a lot from the lack of cars. After the Korean War broke out in 1950, the Chinese army had only more than 1,300 vehicles, but in the first week, 217 vehicles were damaged by enemy planes. Because of the shortage of vehicles, food and winter clothing could not be delivered to the front line in time, so there were many soldiers eating potatoes in single clothes in the ice and snow. From 1949 to 1979, in 30 years, China achieved a breakthrough in automobile production from scratch. This breakthrough, some people say it was a success, because China has created Jifang and Dongfang brand cars. But some people say that it failed, because Chinese can only build trucks, but never achieved mass production of cars. In fact, only the manufacturing capacity of cars can represent a country's real carmaking strength. Apart from the fact that it is much more difficult and delicate to build a car than a truck, there is also a subjective reason, the Chinese believed that driving a car was a bourgeois way of life at the time, and only public officials could take a car for their official business needs. But after the reform and opening up, as some people got rich first, 
the people's desire for cars became stronger and stronger. On the other hand, the automobile market demand in developed Western countries such as the United States is beginning to be saturated. In 1970, the United States completed the process of urbanization. In 1980, when the U.S. economy reached its peak, there were 711 cars for every 1,000 people at that time. Except for the elderly and children, almost everyone had one car. For the Fords, if they wanted to grow steadily, there was only one way to go, expand exports. This is also the bottom-level thrust of Nixon's visit to China in 1972 and the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China in 1979. They not only want to win China over to fight the Soviet Union, but they also want to sell Chinese cars, cokes, and shampoo to make money. On one side is the Chinese auto market, which is seriously in short supply, and on the other side is the Western auto market, which is oversupplied. The two are like dry firewood and a fire. From 1983 to 1987, local governments spent 16 billion US dollars in foreign exchange to import cars, equivalent to the net fixed assets of the two Chrysler auto companies at that time. The second breakthrough of Chinese cars is the same as the first breakthrough. Some people say it succeeded because the domestic auto industry is prosperous, but others say it failed because China has been doing things like assembling cars, and there has been no complete localization. The key to the success or failure of localization is the localization of components. The automobile industry originally had a huge industrial chain. An automobile factory needed thousands of parts suppliers to serve it directly. It is this huge industrial system that determines the height of a country's automobile industry. The German Der Spiegel Weekly said a truth. There are hardly any parts factories in China, and Shanghai Volkswagen seems to be left on an isolated island for production. Automobile manufacturing was originally a technology-intensive industry, but in China, it has become labor-intensive. According to the smile curve theory, in the automotive industry chain, the most profitable areas are design, R&D, and parts production, and the least profitable is the assembly link, which is what Chinese are doing. This is also the root cause of the generally low wages in China's auto industry in recent years. China is very ambitious, but in the end it has become a long-term worker working for foreigners. We have to admit that in the past 100 years, Western developed countries have formed extremely high technical barriers and industrial chain advantages in the automobile industry. In 2018, Two giants of BYD and Ningda era emerged in China in the field of new energy, as well as a number of new car manufacturers such as Weilai, Xiaopeng, and Idea. And traditional fuel car companies such as FAW, Second Automobile, SAIC, and Geely have also started the layout of new energy vehicles. In just 20 years, China has not only established a complete supply chain system for new energy vehicles, but has basically achieved localization in the core areas of new energy vehicles, batteries, motors, and electronic controls, and some core technologies have even surpassed Western developed countries, for example, in terms of batteries, BYD and Ningda have rushed to the top five in the world in the era. As early as 2015, China has officially overtaken the United States, becoming the world's largest new energy vehicle market and the world's largest power battery producer. Until today, China has finally squeezed into the train of the new energy era with a platform ticket in the era of fuel vehicles, and also sat in business class. Okay, that's all for today. How do you think about it? Please put your comments or suggestions in the comments below, and share your thoughts about today's topic, so that we can have a further discussion. Your immediate reply is the encouragement that we can move on more videos in the future.
If you like our videos, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We will see you in the next video. Goodbye.